Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Southern Oregon University, SOU, and the Friends of the Hannon Library Speaker Series. Tonight's topic is Shifting Landscapes of Learning in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Before we begin, let us acknowledge our connection to this land and its history. The following comes from the Native American Studies Program here at SOU. Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon is built on the traditional lands of the Tekelma and Shasta peoples. Today, we recognize the many tribes and bands who call the Klamath Basin region their ancestral territory. And we highlight the continued sovereignty of the nine tribes of Oregon and Northern California who have ties to this place. The Friends of the Hannon Library are dedic is dedicated to adding to the collection at the library and hosting this speaker series. If you're not a member, consider joining us. More information is on the Hannon Library webpage. We have three more speaker series events this season. The next is on March 11th with Betty LeDuc, reflecting on the challenges of 2020 for art, community, and social justice. Now some housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and will be available to watch later. We'll all be muted except of course our guest speakers during the presentation. There will be a question and answer as time permits. Please post your questions in the chat feature of Zoom and Erica Knotts, the Zoom master of ceremonies will be doing the question and answers. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's guests. Margaret Perro is Professor of English and Eng English Education at SOU. She's currently Chair of the English Program and Director of the Oregon Writing Project at SOU, which is a professional development organization for teacher. She holds a PhD from Berkeley in Language, Literacy, and Culture and Education. She's conducted research in South Africa for over 20 years, and her book, A Hidden History of Youth Development in South Africa, Learning in Transition will be published by Rutledge in mid-March. You can find more information on her website, learningintransition.org. Amber Reed is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at SOU. She earned her PhD in Cultural Anthropology from UCLA in 2014, and before coming to SOU, worked in both anthropology and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University in Philadelphia. She's been working in South Africa since 2009 on issues of youth, education, democracy, and socioeconomic inequality. You can find more information on her at website, amberreed.co. And now here is Margaret Perot. How'd that work, Erica? Everything looks great. Fabulous. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. Um, I would like to start off with the greeting Sunny Bona, which is um, in, in Isi Zulu, which is one of the 11 national languages uh, recognized in the South African constitution, means hello, but it also literally means I see you. And if we were in person and I said that, you would respond, Yebo, yes, and you would say back, Sunny Bona, I see you as well, which I think is a lovely way to start any kind of interaction, but unfortunately it's a bit strange because tonight I can't see you actually except for in my mind's eye, so I will be visualizing you. Um, hello, thank you for being here on Thursday evening. Thanks to Friends of Hannon Library and big, big thanks to my fabulous colleague Erica Knotts for her technical wizardry behind the scenes. Um, I know how challenging that, that can be. I'm going to tell a story tonight that emerges out of um, over 20 years of research that I've been doing in youth development in South Africa since legalized apartheid officially ended. But this story also reaches back um, through centuries of oppression and inequity. And it's over the years, it's acquired a deeper personal meaning for me. So I'm gonna try to weave some of those pieces together tonight and riff a little bit off the book that's coming out in March. Um, Post-apartheid is now a kind of a dated term, right? So the 1994 elections marked the end of apartheid law and the beginning of universal democracy. And when I began my research into youth development, which was way back in 1998, the newly democratic South Africa still largely had faith in um, the African National Congress, which was Nelson Mandela's party, and 
also known as the ANC, and their slogan of a better life for all. And since then, that 1998, I've continued to return to South Africa following changes in the lives of a group of people that I came to know when they were young adults, and they're in the picture that you can see on the screen here uh, back in 1998. Some of them might be here tonight because they were curious and really hoped to come, but it's five o'clock in the morning in South Africa. So um, if they're not, I totally understand, but I do feel that they're with me here tonight when I talk about all of this, this work. Just for a little bit of context, um, in 1994, you might remember that there were elections that marked the, the formal end of apartheid law and the beginning of universal um, democracy and voting for everybody. And there was a great optimism that things would dramatically improve for the black majority population, most of whom lived in relative poverty in either urban townships or so-called um, homelands in the rural areas. Mandela had just been, well, just been, he'd been released from prison four years prior in 1990. He'd been imprisoned on Robben Island for 27 years. And of course he was then elected president. And that's a picture of him presumably casting his ballot for, um, for himself and his party. Now, from that point, I wanna zoom forward to 2018, which was my last visit back to Soweto and to South Africa and introduce you to uh, Philemon. By the way, the people that I talk about tonight all, they're all pseudonyms and they're all pseudonyms that they chose for themselves in the research project. So this is um, Philemon. I first met him in 1998 when he was just in his 20s. He had joined an employment skills project for young adults at the NGO, the non-government organization, where I was a visiting researcher. So 20 years later, fast forward, it's 2018. Philemon and the other participants were now in their 40s or 50s. And I remember that year sitting with Philemon on upturned plastic crates in his mom's um, cinder block yard in, at her, in her house, that's her house in Soweto. Soweto, by the way, is the sprawling conglomerate of townships outside of Johannesburg um, that's home to over 2 million black South Africans. And I remember sitting on an upturned plastic crate there talking to Philemon that morning. And he thought back to the 1980s and the 1990s. And he said, there was the struggle and the elections, but did we or didn't we achieve freedom? So we were drinking orange Fanta. I don't know why I remember that, but we pondered his question sort of in light of his life circumstances. Despite his hopes and dreams 20 years later, Philemon was still unemployed. He did get a monthly child support grant, which was about $30 US dollars a month. And that was not enough to feed his family or pay the rent on the one room shack where he lived with his wife and his young daughter. And he'd been on the waiting list for a government house since 1999. And then he added this, we're still being oppressed even though we gained democracy. Some people got rich, but it wasn't us. And I think in a sense that comment kind of sums up the socioeconomic changes and the socioeconomic reproduction or lack of changes in South Africa over the past two decades. Um, a little bit more current, current context now. So for contemporary South Africa, South Africa is still a vastly unequal country and it's vastly unequal still along racial lines despite growing numbers of black people joining the middle class or the, or the wealthy classes, the overall population of South Africa has grown steadily over the past two decades so that today there are more than 60 million people in South Africa and approximately 80% of those are black Africans, just under 8% are whites and about 9% are colored and 3% are Indian. So the vast majority are black, are black Africans in South Africa. And despite a rise in what's called the black middle class sometimes, and increases in these social welfare grants, like the ones that Philemon gets for his, for his daughter, as the population has continued to rise, the sheer number of people living in poverty has also continued to grow. And the wealth gap is persistent. The World Bank has called South Africa the most, if not, or close to the most um, unequal country in the world using their Gini coefficient measures of the gap between wealthy and poor. Okay, so that's a little bit of current context. Now at this point, I want to diverge and I wanna introduce another character in my personal story. The slide might not be terribly clear, um, but a century earlier, around 1919, a white South African captain named FAP, known as Percy Perro, arrived in Johannesburg after a solo 20 day cross country drive from Cape Town, it's about a thousand miles. And after he, after he completed that journey, he snapped this picture or these pictures or had somebody snap it. It was the days before selfies, but I like that he titled it Self, an NAG card. It's kind of like his selfie. Upon arrival in Joburg from Cape Town, South Africa, after a long, lone trip, he put on, the, on those pictures. So um, 
he made this trip in this Ford NAG car. If anybody knows anything about that car, I'm trying to find out some information about that vehicle. I haven't been able to find anything on Ford NAG. Um, and after he made that trip, he read a newspaper report about somebody else who had made the, a similar trip, um, the Cape to the Rand, in a 10 horsepower Samsung car. This guy was named Mr. Dean. And the newspaper reported Mr. Dean's dash from the Cape to the Rand in a 10 horsepower Samsung car. Dean claimed that he was the first person through since the rains. And Perro sort of took a little bit of offense at this. He, he, he said he wasn't trying to attempt any record breaking, but he wanted to set the record straight. He took longer maybe on this trip, but he'd in fact made it through earlier, even while he was battling the last of, this, of the rains of the rainy season. Okay, that was a diversion, right? Captain Percy Perro was my paternal grandfather, whom I never met. He had served in World War I on the colonial campaigns in Central Africa for the British Empire. He was an accomplished engineer and he'd won a prestigious award from a professional organization in South Africa of which his father happened to be the president. And in, his in this photo with the car, I think he looks you know, pretty proud and unruffled, but he could only be so unpossessed in 1919 South Africa if he had certain blinders on. In his account that he sent to the newspaper, he briefly mentioned spending some time in towns which would have meant interacting with white residents and their black servants, but not necessarily acknowledging the lived reality of the black majority because of the geographic separation that existed. So even though apartheid didn't become legal law of the land until 1948, when the National Party took power, apartheid policies and practices were really present everywhere in the decades before that. Blacks and whites lived in separate places and lived vastly unequal lives, Inequality was geographic, educational, and economic. Black land ownership was illegal outside of the so-called reserves. Blacks were excluded from skilled employment. It was illegal to hold a skilled, um, a skilled position and subject to pass laws if they wanted to travel anywhere outside of where they were allowed to live. Owning a car, for instance, would have been unthinkable to most Black Africans who were essentially a source of low-skilled labor serving the economic interests of the white minority and my grandfather was one of, one of them. But I wasn't fully aware of this family history when I arrived in Johannesburg in 1998. In fact, I didn't come across this picture until a couple of years ago. We'll come back to Captain Perro in a bit. I'm gonna take you to the Joint Enrichment Project now. So in 1998, I got to Johannesburg with an interest in alternative education programs. I was really curious about what learning in programs that offered alternative education meant to the participants and what impact it might have on their lives especially in a context like South Africa where the broader socioeconomic transition was supposedly happening so quickly, right? So I was really fortunate to come across an influential um, NGO called the Joint Enrichment Project, which is abbreviated to JEP um, in Johannesburg. It was one of the NGOs that played a, a vital role in bringing South Africa out of the apartheid era and into the, the world economy in the 1990s. So it was a great place to explore my questions about learning in socio-political contexts that were changing. The Joint Enrichment Project had been founded by the South African Council of Churches and the Council of Catholic Bishops in the 1980s. And it played a super important role in the anti-apartheid struggle in lots of different ways. Um, it was a pioneer in the field of youth development. <clears throat> it led the way in piloting some projects, types of projects that the government, it wanted the government to take up. And in fact, the government did take up eventually in some, in some respects. And it played a key role in the formation of national youth policy, and even in the discussion of how youth were conceptualized, the whole concept of youth in the public discourse. And the third reason that it was a great place for me was that it was highly visible to international donors. So I figured it was pretty stable and it was gonna be around for a while. So it was a great place to look at the meaning and the impact of learning in alternative education settings. I warn you, the next slide is a little bit glaring. It's really very ugly, but it's a metaphor that might help explain when, when I step back to try to give you a gist of what the, what the book is about, because that's not what I'm doing tonight, I'm just giving you a little slice tonight. But after tracing the history of the Joint Enrichment Project for, for this long and following participants and staff, I've started to see that JEP functioned as kind of a prism. It sort of refracted broader changes in post-apartheid South Africa in different ways. So the beams in the prism coming through the Joint Enrichment Project correspond to, we might think of one of them as being the landscape of youth development in general, policy and practice. Kind of, we can look at, trace that through the Joint Enrichment Project. Um, the directors, it, the, the organization served as a platform for its directors, many of whom were already prominent 
anti-apartheid activists. So the directors could be another beam along that line of light. And for staff, the staff could be another beam that we could look at. For the staff, it was kind of, the organization was like a catapult. It propelled them somewhat uneasily, and I'll talk about that in a bit, into middle and wealthy, wealthier classes. For participants, they could be another beam on that line. For the participants, it served as a touchstone in their lives or gave them a really strong sense of belonging and connection to the broader changes that were taking place in South Africa. And it was also a stepping stone to the next thing in their lives. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't a major engine of socioeconomic change for them. So these are the different sort of um, light beams that we could look at. Ultimately, the whole picture is of an organization that made huge lasting contributions to youth development as a field and functioned also something of, of an organ of, as an organ of um, socioeconomic reproduction. So it reflected broader patterns in post-apartheid South Africa. And I think that will be more clear by the time that I, that I finish. My focus tonight is on two of those streams of light, really, not on all of them that are coming out of the prism. The, prism, the, um, the youth participants and the staff. Okay, so now I'm going to take you away from that horrible diagram back to the youth work scheme. This was one of the many pilot projects the joint enrichment project was was putting out. It was a six month uh, project full time for the participants. They learned hard skills. They were renovating a community center. They learned some carpentry and some tiling and some painting. And then there were soft skills, things like communications and personal development and planning for your future. And it was here that I got to know Philemon and the other 14 participants from Soweto. I had the pr privilege of working alongside them for that whole time while they renovated the community center and, and planned for, for, their, for their future. And by the time that project was over, they had experienced, all of them had experienced a significant shift psychologically and socially from feeling stuck in between to feeling in transition, in a rapidly transitioning country. And that was a significant shift to move from feeling stuck in between to feeling like you're in transition. They often would say to me, it's happening, Margaret, it's happening. And they would look to their future with this sort of new sense of confidence and optimism. So this is a picture of three of them. This is Tabo and um, Lovely and Isayash standing in front of the Hector Peterson Memorial in Soweto. Hector Peterson was the first young person who was killed in the killed by police in the um, 1976 youth uprising. So I'll explain to you how this, how I think this happened, that they move from the sense of being in between to in transition um, in, in several ways. So they, when they came into the project, they were historically in between. So it was 1998, they were too young to have been part of, or to have been an active part of the youth movement that had happened and really came to the fore in 1976. So as, Christopher quote, as Christopher's quote shows here, he was two years old when that happened, but clearly the way you, what you can see from their positioning around this tombstone, this memorial, is it was immensely meaningful to them. They felt very connected to the movement, but they were too young to have been part of it historically, okay? They were also too old, just a little bit too old, to have benefited from the changes in education that had started to happen. So the ability to attend a school that was outside of their township neighborhood, for instance, those sorts of things hadn't, hadn't started happening yet or had, hadn't happened when they were in school. Now they were finished with school. So historically they're, they were in between. Materially kind of stands for a lot of things. They were not living in abject poverty. They were living in small four room homes, the township houses or council houses in Soweto with an extended family usually. Most had some indoor kitchen plumbing they usually had an outhouse outside of the house in the back. Um, they had, most of them had telephones, but not all at that time. Um, but they were all unemployed. Like the majority of young adults from the township, they were all unemployed. And this put them sort of in between materially, but they knew that they weren't in the most abject poverty of people in South Africa, and they clearly were not amongst the wealthy. So it, materially, they were, a little, they were in between. And discursively, by discursively, I mean discourse, or if, I'm talking about ways of talking, ways of interacting, ways of being, right? So discursively, they were also in between. They were in between traditional collective hierarchical discourses that they would have experienced in school and even in their homes where they were very, they were their family, their older family members, especially, there were very sort of traditional hierarchical discourses and gendered ways of, of talking. That was one side. And now all of a sudden there were these emerging calls for student-centered learning for raising one's individual voice in a competitive market economy. And these ideas of individuation and competition, which showed up in school and were really different from what they had experienced in school in the past, 
were aligned with and reflected the broader neoliberal economic context that they were that they were living in, right? That the transition was happening in. So I was really interested in the discourse aspect of this, and I started looking carefully at what was happening when they were in workshops or on the work site, when moments when the discourse itself became the focus of their conversation, when they were talking about how traditional ways of talking were clashing maybe with new ways of talking. So those were moments in navigating those moments, those entangled discourses that were sometimes contradictory. They began to reposition themselves in relation to each other, to their team. And that led to this sense of a changing self or a self in transition in a broader transitioning context. All right, so now we're gonna go fast forward again um, to 2018. I, so I've been curious over the years to know how their lives have changed and what practical long-term difference the, their participation in this organization might have made. So I went back in 2002 and in 2009, and then again in 2018 for extended periods of time to live and to learn about what their lives were like. Um, and I was asking these questions, how have their life circumstances changed? And how has the shift to an in-transition identity that they experienced back then played out for them uh, 20 years later. So here, there again on the upper left is the picture of Tabo and Lovely and Isai Ash in 1998. And the color photos are the three of them uh, in 2018. By now, the work scheme participants, they were in their 40s and 50s. Most had children of their own. They had experienced some incremental material positive changes in their lives. Most of them had jobs, although they had a lot of income insecurity. They all lived on paved streets by now, which was not the case 20 years earlier. Most had indoor toilets in their houses. Two had actually bought their own small homes in Soweto near where they had grown up. Um, one had received a government house where she lived with her two children. Two actually owned cars, but they couldn't afford to repair them or buy the gas for them. So there were these incremental material changes that were obvious, right, that you could see. But they expressed this great disappointment that change had come so slowly, that their lives in 2018 were not as different from, 19, from 1998 as they had hoped. Like I said, their employment, employment was precarious, their money always ran out before the end of the month, and they felt the government had not delivered on the promises of 1994. None of them felt they had the means to reach the employment goals that they had laid out two decades earlier. So that was kind of an uncomfortable finding for me that their participation in the organization had profoundly and enduringly affected their self-identities, but it had not changed their life trajectory substantially. Okay. Their experiences reflected the reality for me and reminded me that 100 years after my grandfather's privileged journey across the country, these widespread racialized inequities persisted. So another personal interlude, I was gradually coming to another critical and uncomfortable understanding. What I was starting to understand was that the hidden history of youth development that I was researching was part of my own hidden history, my own coming to terms with being the daughter of a white South African man who left the country in 1951. That was my dad, who was the son of um, Percy Perro. Left in 51 for an engineering internship and never went back to live there. My father had the white government of South Africa largely to thank for his privileged status, but that's not all that it was. My own privileged life here today in Southern Oregon derives in large part from the wrongs done to black people in South Africa over the years. My comfortable little home in the mountains, my PhD from a prestigious university, my ability to take a sabbatical from my teaching job, book a plane ticket to Johannesburg, rent a car when I get there, all of that ties back to that history, like a secret umbilical cord in a way. And in this sense, my journeys to South Africa became part of a process of seeking a story that would help me put together some conflicted pieces of the past. I think I was looking for a way to understand my personal relationship to a history of racism and oppression, both in South Africa and here in Oregon. In addition to telling the story of this remarkable organization, the Joint Enrichment Project, and its impact on the country and on some incredible South Africans that I got to know, I was also recomposing myself. And I wanna point out here that this, I think this happens a lot to researchers, especially in long research projects. And I think it's really important to stay open to the surprises and the personal insights and revelations that happen along the way, although it's not always um, particularly comfortable. Um, so that's that pers little personal interlude. Now, here's, here's what came out of it for the participants. 20 years later, they were still feeling like the project was a touchstone for them. A touchstone was the stone that you could rub, I think, and it would tell you how much gold, the, the measure of gold that was in, um, in, a, in a 
mineral, right? It was a touchstone for them in the sense of a sense of agency. I did that, they would say, even 20 years later, pointing at something they had done in the project. Um, I can do that, the sort of self-confidence. This is my team and the sense of belonging that they still recall 20 years later, learning to interact with different kinds of people. So in this sense, JEP was the JEP was a, was a touchstone for them that connected them to something bigger um, and that defined their time in the organization when they looked back 20 years later. But socioeconomically, they had gone back to feeling in between. That exuberant sense of being in transition was mostly gone. They shared this sense that change had been too slow. They shared their disillusion with, disillusionment with the government. I'm gonna quickly cycle through some slides that show you um, where, the, where they are today. And if you're interested in learning more about them, they and I together, we put together some five minute little short videos. They're on my website. You can check those out and in, get introduced a little bit more deeply to some of these, to some of these people. Um, this is Lungile. The big picture is her standing in 2018 outside the house she grew up in. The road is now paved. And the upper right corner is her with her two uh, children outside the one, one room house that she got from the government and she cleverly partitioned off so that they could all live in there. And that she's lived there for nearly 20 years. She works at the post office. She has a night shift job at the post office. It takes her an hour and 45 minutes to get there, several taxi rides away, each way. This is Tavo and uh, standing outside the door probably of the house that he just purchased in Soweto, not far from where his parents live. And in the upper right, it's his third child, his, his daughter. He was able to buy this house because he, of all of the participants, had the most stable long-term job as a truck mechanic, um, which he unfortunately has just lost, which is terrible news. Um, but this is the house that he was able to buy um, not too far away from where he grew up with his, um, with his family. This is Isayesh. She is in, in this picture, she's at the Tupperware store. She uh, makes money selling Tupperware that she reselling Tupperware from the Tupperware store. She still has hopes and plans to go back to school, but she's not been able to pay the fees that she owes, the back fees. And she ended up taking care of her mother who was ill for several years. And so she's trying to get that, that going again. She lives in the same house that she grew up in with her siblings and their children um, in Soweto. This is uh, Rebecca who also lives in the house that she grew up in, that's her front gate. She has a job as a daycare worker close to where she lives. Um, she dreams of starting her own business. She's not sure how she's gonna do that, but that's her, that's her, her goal. She has three children all in sort of the high school adult age who live with her in her extended family in this house where she grew up in Soweto. And finally, David, um, David has been doing a recycling business from his house. This is the house where he grew up in Soweto. He still lives there. That is his daughter. He lives there with his brother and sister-in-law and his wife and daughter live in the back. And he has a recycling business that he runs out of the garage and on the street. He's built a cart by hand that he loads the recycling onto every week and pulls it eight kilometers to the recycling depot. Um, and that's how he survives. So in sum, they feel incremental changes in their um, socioeconomic status or no changes. But I mean, there've been some changes in their material circumstances, the paved streets, the indoor toilets, some washing machines, but many live in the house they grew up in. Others have moved quite close by these modest social grants that they get don't go too far. They all have concerns about crime and drugs in their neighborhoods. They, here's the big thing though, they can't afford to send their children to fee paying schools. So mostly they send their children to the fee free government schools in the townships, which you won't be surprised are the under resourced schools, the schools that have far fewer resources than the schools in the formerly white suburbs that are fee paying or private schools. So are they still in between? This is, it's a subjective question, right? It's, there's no question that the Joint Enrichment Project profoundly and enduringly affected their sense of self-identity, but I don't think it affected their life trajectory. I think for them that the program was a stepping stone um, and, and, and that's where pretty much where, where it stopped. Um, but here's a question, whoops, here's a question. What about former staff? And I, my time is almost up and I'm getting close to the end of this presentation, but this is where things get really interesting, I think actually. Um, and I think problematic for social justice NGOs that are trying to be transformative forces in society. Because there were very few differences between the, the participants and the staff in terms of their age, they were the same age, their, dem their racial demographics, even they came from some of the same, from the same neighborhoods. What was different between participants and staff was their educational background. The staff had slightly more education, slightly more privileged education than the participants had had. And what happened to the staff was that the NGO served for them as an incubator of their skills. It incubated their social capital, it incubated their sense of agency, and then it acted like this rocket launching pad 
for them socioeconomically and professionally. So it moved them, in some cases it propelled them into lives of relative wealth and privilege relatively quickly. So here are just a few pictures of some of the staff. Um, the income insecurity and the in-betweenness of the participants, that was largely reproduced over time. Whereas for the staff, they were launched into this new middle class and did things like became high, highly sought after government consultants or um, consultants in other areas or held high level government positions, went to earn their PhDs, became leaders of innovative youth development organizations. Their living circumstances to a person have changed dramatically. They have all moved out of the townships. Um, they all own gated homes or they call them estates in what were formerly white suburbs. Their children all attend private schools. Um, some of them more expensive than others, but their children all attend private schools. And they have a really strong sense of agency and purpose which they universally attribute to their time at the Joint Enrichment Project, the learning that they did at the Joint Enrichment Project. And this is the staff now, not the participants. They've personally benefited from South Africa's post-apartheid accomplishments, but they still live in a country that's struggling to achieve economic growth and equity with unemployment still, as I said earlier, I think just under 30% and youth unemployment still well over 50%. They're ambivalent about this. They express ambivalence, a sense of frustration that the country hasn't seen the kind of transformation they had hoped for and they were working for. And they regret that the Joint Enrichment Project did, couldn't do more to make that happen, um, didn't have that broad transformative impact. These are two quotes that I just wanted to share with you as sort of to sort of tie this up. Seppo works for the city of Johannesburg. He says, for me, there is anger. You're telling me this is freedom, but actually it's free for some, not for all of us. Which brings us back to Philemon's comment at the beginning about some people gained freedom, but other people didn't. Um, and it also, it also raises the question of how are we defining freedom, which is a whole other conversation. Uh, Kahiso is now the um, director of Youth Build South Africa, which is um, an exciting program that he's working to build up. He thought about what he called his fairly decent lifestyle, and he was clearly uncomfortable. He said he didn't want his kids to struggle the way he had as a child. Hence the private schools, the Uber accounts, the electronics. Um, and he said, but there's stuff I don't like about it. It can create kids who are disconnected. We're so busy trying to create a future for them that our kids are disconnected from what we do as development practitioners. That troubles me. So the challenge for them as parents who are social justice activists is just that. They appreciate their, their relative material affluence, right? They appreciate their children's promising futures, but they're troubled by it. They deeply regret that the dream that they had worked toward when they were at the Joint Enrichment Project, the integration of young people into the economy, helping them achieve a significantly better future, that that dream has manifested for them as individuals, but not on a large scale for youth in South Africa. And so here's the last person I'm gonna bring into this conversation. Feroz Manji is a Kenyan activist um, who's written about the difference between licensed freedoms and emancipatory freedoms. And I think this helps explain the phenomenon and the feelings that the former staff at the um, Joint Enrichment Project have. Manji says that licensed freedoms are freedoms that are gained within an existing system or framework. So they change individuals' lives for the better, but they don't change the system or the overall, um, the overall power structure or even bring about a new order, right? So Manji's been critical of contemporary NGOs that in fact work to help people gain licensed freedoms within a neoliberal political, um, politi political economic context. This helps explain, I think, the ambivalence and the distress of some of the former staff. They appreciated that transformation in their personal circumstances, but they universally lament that these are nonetheless individual licensed freedoms, that JP's impact wasn't more broadly um, emancipatory. I wanna be clear though, that none of this is meant to minimize or diminish the impact, the significant impact of the Joint Enrichment Project and other NGOs that do this kind of work. But it's important, I think, to recognize the deeply entrenched and systemic nature of the inequality and the challenges that face social justice organizations that try to make learning a transformative force, whether it's in individual lives or in entire societies. So let me see if I can pull some of these threads together here. Um, Oh, there's one more person I need to introduce you to. This is Lovely's grandma. As I kept going back to South Africa in search of this hidden history of youth development and socioeconomic change, I can now see, as I said, that I was also in search of my own hidden history. And maybe a South Africa that was different from the one that produced my father, 
and Captain Perrow, who, by the way, concluded his charming but pretty self-congratulatory little newspaper story with a complaint about, quote, the number of gates he encountered on his cross-country journey, which he called one of the most, one of the greatest drawbacks on the run. This kind of made me laugh. Of course, we all encounter gates on our journeys, right? But the degree of challenge that they pose is relative to our privilege. A gate could be opened. For Lovely's grandma, breaking a pass law would send her to jail. So once we understand the systemic oppression and privilege that we're a part of, blame and guilt aren't productive responses, really. What we do is what, is what matters. And I think that my hope is that my research contributes to conversations about the role of learning and education in struggles for social justice. Um, and I also hope that it amplifies some of the voices that otherwise might go unheard in public discourse. My best hope of knowing a different South Africa lies in something my father would have found curious, I think, and he probably would have even found it troubling. Um, the love and the caring of Black South African friends and Ugogo, like Lovely's grandma, who make me feel like a whole person, not just a white person, when I'm in Soweto with them. Philemon's mother is one of those Ugogo, and so is Lovely's granny here, who turned 99 and then just recently passed away to join her ancestors. Sometimes, I wish that I could communicate with my ancestors. Isayash tells me I probably can if I try. I like to think that as they watch our relationships unfold over the years, our ancestors are busy talking to each other, lending their support to positive social change. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards because I'm going to now turn this over to my colleague, Amber Reed. Thanks, Margaret. And I'm just going to go ahead and get the PowerPoint set up here. So I, I think one thing that's really lovely about doing this presentation alongside Margaret is that we are kind of telling flip sides of the same story. So Margaret's work has focused primarily on an urban area, um, and I have looked at a rural area. So I'll be talking about my recent book um, that just came out this past November. This is a, a picture of it. It's called Nostalgia After Apartheid, Disillusionment, Youth, and Democracy in South Africa. Um, so Margaret and I have explored some very similar issues about education, but in somewhat very different contexts and uh, with the different demographics as well. Um, so I asked this kind of central research question when I started out in rural South Africa, which was how do young South Africans learn about democracy in the wake of apartheid? One thing that I really liked that Margaret brought up is this notion of the kind of twists and turns that research takes um, and the ways that we are often surprised as researchers. Because when I started out asking this question, I very much was kind of oriented, oriented towards the future. I was thinking about kind of what are the futures for young people after apartheid. Um, but what I found and what the book title kind of refers to is this overwhelming interest in talking about the past um, and not so much what one might expect, which are the horrific traumas of the apartheid era, but actually a kind of um, surprising, at least it was to me, nostalgia for elements of this past. Um, and this is where I think this difference between the urban area like Soweto that Margaret highlighted and this rural area uh, that I'll be talking about really becomes poignant in the different types of realities that we see see uh, during apartheid. Um, so some of this Margaret already covered. Um, I'll talk specifically about what this has to do with um, education in a moment. But when we talk about apartheid, one element that was really important for my research was the creation of these so-called independent Bantu stands or homelands, as Margaret mentioned. Um, and essentially, the reason the independent is in quotes is because these were only recognized as uh, independent nations, as separate nations by the South African um, white minority Afrikaner national government, right? They weren't recognized as independent by any other part of the world. Um, and so the, the kind of philosophy behind this was to create rural areas with forcible removal um, of black laborers who could then be called upon in service of a white supremacist state, um, but kept out of the kinds of privileges, obviously, of white life in South Africa at the time. 
Um, and I want to mention here, and also Margaret mentioned, the importance of understanding this history as not just beginning suddenly in 1948, um, but how this kind of relied on previous instantiations and ideas about um, ethnicity and race and, and different groupings that started with Dutch and then British colonialism in the country, right? So um, British colonists played a huge role in creating these really oversimplified ideas of certain types of ethnic groups and then tying them to certain home lands or geographies. So for instance, um, and I'll talk about it in a moment, in the group, the cultural group that I have worked with, the Kosa people, there is um, a kind of now unified sense of identity that belies a much more complicated history of ethnicity. So this is a map showing these different uh, Bantustans or homelands. And so this turquoise color is the former trans sky. Um, so yellow is all of South Africa. Um, and that is the, this turquoise area is the area where I did my research. Um, in this presentation, I don't have uh, a lot of information about the actual ethnographic process, but I'll say here that, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, um, that I did research, the predominant amount of this research was done in 2012, where I lived in this rural area um, and looked uh, particularly at these educational spaces to answer this question. So I want to talk a little bit more about the trans sky and the people that live there um, or lived there then. So this is the ancestral home of the Xhosa people. That is a clicking language. It is one of these 11 official languages of South Africa that Margaret mentioned. Um, but Hi, again, Amber. Sorry, Hi. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Are you That's able to start your presentation so we can't see you clicking through the slides? Oh, because um, they're clicking on my end. Yeah, on our side, all we see is your very first slide. So huh. are you able to put it into presentation mode for us? It is in presentation mode on my screen. Um, I'll try again. What happens now? Um, still seeing the same thing. Hmm. That's very strange. Um, let me let me try stopping the share and seeing if I can fix it. So sorry about that. No, that's fine. I wish I'd realized. Uh, what do you see now? I see about half of your screen. Um, huh. and it looks a little faded. faded. But yeah, are you able to? And now? Whole... Okay, so I see your whole slideshow now. Huh. Um, I okay. see it. In I'm using two monitors, so oh, that must be it. Sorry, okay. folks. Um, how is it now? What do you see now? Perfect. That is exactly what we need. And are and are you seeing the slide of the houses? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So let me just backtrack a little. I'm sorry about that, folks. Thank you. Um. So these are just pictures that I that I was showing before to kind of highlight this particular identity that I'm talking about in these cultural groups in this area. Um, and maybe you weren't able to see this map, but this map and that turquoise area is the area of the country that I'm talking about, this former trans sky. And I'm also happy to go back over any of this in the Q&A. Um, so I want to talk particularly about education practices, both during apartheid, but also after and how this impacts this research question. Um, so of particular importance here was this legislative act called the Bantu Education Act of 1953. And what this act did was uh, take education out of the hands of private institutions like schools and put it all under government control. So this is not to say that there weren't all kinds of problems or racial segregation in schools before this moment, but this officially and kind of codified the extension of apartheid into schools and classrooms. Um, and so what this meant was that the national curriculum that was infused into all schools, black, white, um, and other schools was racist and discriminatory, Explicitly. Um, and there was this logic that you shouldn't be preparing Black students for careers that they wouldn't be able to occupy. Um, so under Bantu education, Black students were really trained only for unskilled or vocational labor. Um, whole subjects were left out of the curriculum. Um, Unsurprisingly, the kind of separate but equal rhetoric that was officially espoused was not the case. Um, and there were highly subpar facilities and the schools, particularly in rural areas, were greatly under-resourced. Um, also of importance here was that native languages were outlawed in favor of Afrikaans, the language of the oppressor. Um, and this was a way both to kind of um, to try to stamp out cultural practices, but also to um, try to stop resistance, right? Try to stop people from communicating across cultural barriers. 
um, and let me know if the slideshow has any problems again. Um, so thinking after apartheid, right, and some of this was talked about already, um, in 1994, as we know, Nelson Mandela becomes the first democratically elected president. And importantly for my work, and you'll see why in a moment, the constitution that is written then has really been heralded by a lot of the world as the world's most progressive, particularly in terms of the liberal swath of human rights protections that are in it, things that we don't necessarily see in much of the world's constitutions. Um, and a part of the project of the post-apartheid moment was really to infuse this kind of sense of multiculturalism, right, the, the quote unquote rainbow nation into every facet of life after the horrors of apartheid. Um, so maybe unlike some other parts of the world where there's an effort to kind of just move on, there's been a major effort to kind of address and um, rectify this kind of past through this idea of multiculturalism. Of course, and, and this is the statistic that Margaret mentioned, this is not necessarily the reality for people's lives. So the World Bank has talked about uh, South Africa as the most unequal society in the world. The chart you see here shows the per capita income by three different racial groups um, over 1987 to 2008, and it's been um, controlled for inflation. And so basically what you see is that wealth remains in the hands of white South Africans by and large, and um, the reddish color is the black African population and you see very little change in terms of um, an accumulation of wealth or a real change in the dis distribution of wealth. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened in education policy after apartheid. So part of this project of multiculturalism was to design a new curriculum that really promoted these values and trained young people to become democratic citizens. Um, but at the same time, so at the same moment they're doing this in in theory, in practice, these neoliberal capitalist education policies are basically ensuring that schools will continue to have de facto racial segregation. Um, so policies uh, are set forth that, that basically make funding decentralized for different schools throughout the provinces. Um, and what we also see is that parent-teacher associations convene and are able to set their own fees at schools that are otherwise free schools. So uh, basically parents and teachers come together, and particularly in, in wealthier and often white schools, decide to set additional fees that they know that their families um, at that school can pay. And that means they're able to hire more staff to have a better um, student to teacher ratio. They're able to buy books. They're able to buy technology. And you don't obviously see similar things in you know, rural black areas where there's widespread poverty and families just can't afford those fees. The national curriculum statement, which was basically a national um, policy or change in education in 2005, mandated a ton of these different kind of programs to promote democracy. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk today about a class called life orientation. Um, so there's other areas that I did research on this topic within, and I don't have time to discuss them here, um, but the book discusses particularly um, some similar kinds of non-governmental organization programs that also have done some of this democratic work with youth, um, not dissimilar from some of what Margaret is talking about, but I'm going to focus here on public schools. Um, but I, I want to also mention the realities of particularly Eastern Cape education, because the Eastern Cape province has had uh, been mired with a huge amount of issues when it comes to educational attainment despite these kinds of legislative acts. Um, so Africa has something called the National Senior Certificate Exam, which is essentially a kind of exit examination that high school students take at the end of their time. Um, and this determines their qualification for higher education and what kinds of programs they can get into. In 2016, the Eastern Cape province, this is the former Trans Sky, had the lowest pass rate in that exam of any province, a 59.3% of students passed the exam. Um, and very clearly tied to this were huge problems of corruption and misuse of funds. So they were underspending funds. There continues to be allegations of corruption and clientelism in the department. So life orientation class, to tell you a little bit more about it, is particularly for secondary school or what we would call in the US high school students. And the idea behind this class is that they are training democratic citizens. So this emphasis on civic participation is huge for this class. Um, they learn to recognize their human rights. There's an idea that they need to learn to spot signs of child abuse and gender inequality, to participate actively as voters, to support different efforts of multiculturalism and inclusion. 
But the question that I ended up asking that became really interesting to me in my time in the Eastern Cape and in these schools was what happens when the teachers themselves aren't necessarily on board with these lessons or when they think about the ideas here differently than how the official curriculum might intend. So what this brought me to was this widespread and pervasive nostalgia for elements of life under apartheid that teachers in particular, but also young people kept talking about. Um, and, and I should mention there, there was often a pervasive sense of nostalgia among young people who didn't even live during the apartheid era, which is also a really interesting subject to discuss. Um, so many people spoke nostalgically for elements of life during the apartheid era, particularly in this rural area. Um, and I want to emphasize two things there. One is that this was rarely a nostalgia for racial segregation. Um, so instead of talking about wanting to return to this, this racist system of white supremacy, instead there is this emphasis on how the apartheid era seem to allow for a sense of cultural autonomy and a connection to cultural traditions as compared to the present moment, which people talk about as somehow kind of imposing on Kosa culture or on traditional life ways. And I should say here, and I'm sure people um, might want to chime in in the Q&A, that this is a kind of cultural nostalgia for the past that we see in other places as well. So there's a lot of interesting discussion of this, for instance, in post-Soviet nations as well. Um, so this isn't so much about racial segregation. Um, and then the other thing that's really important here is the way this ties to indirect policies of the rural Bantu stands or homelands. Because of this, um, this kind of hands-off approach of the apartheid government, there is this kind of memory of being left alone in these areas. And that's where that sense of autonomy comes from. So this quote here that I mentioned or that I that I give you is actually from a young person who told me in an interview, I was raised under a Kosa tradition, where is the respect for our tradition today? I just think the apartheid government was better. Everything was under control. Um, and you can imagine my surprise when I first started doing research hearing things like this. It was really hard to make sense of because this was from Black rural South Africans who um, who arguably were the most marginalized under apartheid rule, right, and suffered tremendously. And so this was a real surprise to kind of make sense of and hear these types of sentiments. Um, and I should mention here that the young person here in context talking uh, in this quote was talking about the kinds of perceived evils of democracy. So she talked about things like de democracy allowing for same-sex marriage and how that was against her culture or democracy allowing for abortion and how that was against her culture. Um, one big site of this kind of nostalgia is corporal punishment. Um, so South Africa outlawed corporal punishment in schools in 1996, soon after the end of apartheid with an act called the South African Schools Act. Um, but as you might imagine, this doesn't mean that it's actually gone. And in fact, it remains ubiquitous in rural areas and it's almost never um, to my knowledge enforced. Um, and in fact, parents are often supportive of it as well as young people. Um, so this quote kind of speaks to that, that someone told me in our culture, we knew that if you did something wrong, your mother and father were going to beat you but children of today are free to do anything. This is a teacher speaking. Um, and I should say that they meant this in a positive way in the sense, that, or a negative way rather, that this freedom of children is kind of unraveling their ability to control their classroom, their ability to uh, pass on knowledge and their ability to kind of ensure their cultural practices will, will go forward. Um, another sentiment I mentioned here is that I frequently heard people refer to corporal punishment as a form of African love or as an important positive cultural practice. So again, to reiterate, this was an area that people really talk about as kind of the democratic state is infringing and trying to um, change my culture in a way that apartheid didn't want to touch or didn't care about or didn't intervene in. So here's another quote, um, and this is from, uh, I believe, a principal um, that I, I did an interview with telling me before 1994, everything went well, that white government was so strict, especially with students, a student was there to learn and nothing else. But now this government of ours says never touch any person, but that is our culture. If my child doesn't want to learn, I used to use switches, but nowadays our government doesn't want to use them, they're trying to change our culture. 
Um, so again, really kind of surprising, I think, sentiments to hear as an outsider coming into a community that you would expect to speak quite differently about an oppressive white supremacist government. Um, and, I, and I wanna mention here with this particular quote that there's ways in which culture is kind of essentialized in a lot of these sentiments. Um, and I don't have time to kind of go into this here, but there's a, a much larger history of how, for instance, Christian missionaries, um, cemented ideas of, um, of children, of gender that weren't necessarily there before the colonial era, but now are equated with essential Kosa culture or Zulu culture. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if somebody would like. So I guess my, my next question was thinking about, well, if these teachers are so nostalgic, well, what's happening in the classrooms then? Because I'm talking about the very same teachers who are tasked with teaching democracy as nostalgic for the pre-democratic era, which is a real kind of challenge to wrap your brain around. Um, so what I found is that teachers present the life orientation curriculum in ways that align with their own perspectives. So this doesn't mean they're not teaching the lessons, but it means that they are shaping them, reshaping them, changing them in ways that make sense for their particular life view um, or worldview. Um, sometimes this is a very conscious and explicit um, practice, and sometimes it's more subconscious or unconscious. Um, so one way that this might happen is a de-emphasis on the gender equality rhetoric of the curriculum or a kind of changing that rhetoric to fit ideas about gender in, in close culture. Um, another way is that certain types of human rights legislation are omitted. So for example, I interviewed students in 2012 asking them if they were aware uh, that that corporal punishment is illegal. And I can't think of a single, a single young person who told me that they were aware of that fact. So even though they are in a class that is supposed to teach them about their human rights, certain rights are skipped over when they are you know, inconvenient or against the ideals of the teachers. Um, or it might be omitting right, human rights legislation like same-sex marriage or de-emphasizing it. Um, in one particularly poignant example, I had a, a teacher tell me in the teacher's lounge that she gave her life orientation students an assignment um, to write an essay about how to cure the evils of homosexuality, which certainly is not, um, is not what the curriculum is asking her to teach. So it's interesting to think about how these ideas get recast in the classroom. Um, for a lot of other teachers, it is this idea of de-emphasizing the rights portion of human rights and instead emphasizing the responsibilities. Um, so I can't tell you how many times I had people tell me in, in what almost seemed like a catchphrase, uh, this idea, you know, young people these days, they know they have rights, but they don't know they have responsibilities. And this was thought of as a really important piece of democracy that was somehow missing for many people in this area. Um, so these are a few quotes that kind of get at these this filtering. One person told me students don't know what this word means democracy they're concerned with their right their rights and not their responsibilities. Um, and the next two are really about gender in our culture girls used to know there are certain things they cannot do. Or a girl who says she does not want to be married is not speaking the truth her place is in the home. Um, so again, these are all teachers speaking and you can you can see obviously the way this kind of curriculum will get filtered to make sense in terms of cultural worldviews. Another part of this nostalgia, and this is an important piece of the puzzle and something that Margaret discussed, is the way that economic inequality partially drives this nostalgia, not entirely again because part is this kind of cultural worldview, um, but certainly the kinds of economic equality and this staggering difference between different groups of people in the country is, a part, is partly a driver of this dissatisfaction. So as many of you may know, the anti-apartheid movement really relied on these communist ideologies of, of redistributing wealth across racial lines. Um, and that certainly and clearly has not happened in the country. Um, and instead the ANC has really uh, become seen as a kind of handmaiden to neoliberal capitalism. Um, and you've probably seen in international news the accusations of corruption and clientelism over the past couple decades. So there's a real sense that, that uh, democracy as it stands in South Africa has failed people. Um, in 2019, I mentioned here, the official unemployment rate in the Eastern Cape was 37.4% and much higher, something like 50% about for youth. And remember, this is before COVID, right? So let alone now. Um, so people equate these economic failures with democracy. Um, so I mentioned this quote, this was actually a young man standing behind me online at a grocery store one day, um, ranting to me about how Mandela promised us all jobs, where are those jobs now? Um, so this is kind of tied to narratives about democracy and how it has failed people, how it hasn't 
given people the kinds of liberation they were expecting. Um, and I always tell people, remember that this is the only democracy South Africans, unless they've traveled abroad, which most of them have not, um, have encountered, right? So this is, this is the only democracy they have known and it feels like a failure. So I wanted to end just kind of thinking about what do we do with this kind of information? Um, and I have a few thoughts about that and I'm happy to hear other people's thoughts as well. One of these is to kind of recognize the differences between democratic curricula in theory and in practice. So there's a lot of conversations these days, both in the US and internationally about the importance of teaching young people democracy and human rights and how to participate in those processes. Um, but I think what this research demonstrates is the need not just to make sure it's in the curriculum, but actually think about and study how it is being presented and enacted in classrooms, because that can be a very different kind of process. Um, we need to understand and investigate particularly the way memory practices and collective and historical memory filters into and influences education. So thinking about this idea that nostalgia actually becomes a pedagogical tool in the classroom so that young people are learning through the nostalgia of their elders and their teachers. Um, and then more broadly, this points to something that as an anthropologist, I think about a lot because it's central to our discipline, which is the idea of considering how liberal democracy has values that rely on Western cultural ideologies. Um, so leaving with this kind of question about whether or not so-called universal human rights really are universal, whether they really represent um, and uh, address the needs of all people or whether they are kind of uh, products of particular cultural cultural, ideological, and geographic histories. So thank you. I, I put my contact information here and a link to the book if you're interested. Um, and I think now Margaret and I will address questions. I'm just yes, so I'll just jump in real quick as you're addressing questions here. Um, if you would like, and here I can even turn on my video. Here we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Erica Knotts. I'm on the board. I have been trying to run the tech behind the scenes. And I just want to start out by saying, um, Amber and Margaret, thank you so much for sharing today and just, you know, the vulnerability, the stories, the experiences. Um, we are so grateful just as, a, as the friends of the library to have you here and to listen to your really insightful presentation. And I know that we do have some questions in the chat, and so I do want to take a moment to get to those. Um, but if you do have a question for Margaret or Amber, feel free to use the Q&A feature to go ahead and post your questions in there. And uh, Margaret and Amber, I'm going to let you kind of look over those questions and figure out how you kind of want to divvy them up. But I'm here to make sure if you miss a question or anything like that, I'll, I'll help you along as well. Does that sound that, good? That sounds That yeah. sounds. Great. I feel like the question that Andra is asking about slavery in South Africa might lead nicely out of your present, out of your piece, Amber. I mean, I can yeah. talk really briefly about the um, 17th century Dutch colony in this in the Cape. There was slavery. They imported slaves from the West, from the West Indies, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, um, Muslims in particular. And there's a thriving, vibrant culture in the Cape today of the descendants of those people. Um, I believe. I don't know as much about this, Amber, you may know more, but they, the Dutch um, East India Company also brought slaves from the Western Cape, I believe, of Africa. So there was, the, there mm -hmm. was, and that would be the 17th century as well. Mm -hmm. It's not my area of expertise. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I was going to say. So the original colony was the Cape Colony, which is what is now Cape Town. And that was originally not meant to be um, a settlement so much as a way station um, for the Dutch East Indies, basically. Um, and as it grew, yeah, it became more of, a, of an official colony and they imported slaves. And that's where the roots of the now Cape Malay population come from, from, from those populations. Um, so there were kind of, in the history, they discussed failed attempts to enslave the native population um, because of warfare and violence. And so, and so this was their kind of quote unquote solution to that. Um, you know, and I also want to mention here, and I think it's worth mentioning that not so much in South Africa, but across the continent, there was a huge internal slave trade that people don't realize before Europeans ever got to the African continent. Millions of Africans, uh, millions of Africans were enslaved by other Africans, um, kind of a tangent, but I think important to, to be aware of. Um, and then the, the other part of Andre's question about parallels to the US and forms of apartheid. Um, I mean, certainly when I talk to students about 
what happened in South Africa, I used the Jim Crow South as a way to kind of frame and understand the, the way it looked. Um, but talking about the time period differences, right, the fact that this ended so much more recently, at least in terms of the official codification, right, 1994, um, and also the fact that it was nationwide, right, it was a nationwide policy um, rather than specific geographic areas. Uh, Margaret, I don't know if you wanted to go back to any of your. Well, there's a question. I think Amber, they have another one that Devorah's question is right, right up, right along with this about um, educators' mm -hmm. presentation of the topic of civil rights and civic education. It might be something to. Yeah, can... I'm just rereading. Sorry, folks. Teaching civic education and how. Uh, how how educators are presenting these topics. Yeah. Um. So a lot of different ways, I guess. You know, there's a lot of different things I could say, Devorah, but the one thing that I think about immediately is this kind of anecdotal experience that I think highlights what you are asking, um, which is this experience I had where I sat in a classroom, and I talk about this in the book, um, and the teacher was giving the students a worksheet from the Curriculum for Life Orientation where they are given a list of rights um, and then a list of, of hypothetical violations of those rights. Um, and I was looking at the worksheet, you know, right alongside the students at the desks, and I couldn't help but think, you know, these are really vague and ambiguous um, in the sense that one violation could actually be considered multiple different um, types of rights violations, and it wasn't a kind of straight one for one. Um, and the curriculum talked about the importance of an emphasized discussing this idea with, with the students. And the presentation instead involved a much more kind of traditional rote education style. So the students were given a while to work on it independently in silence. And then the teacher called on people and we're talking about, you know, we're in a room of 60 students crammed in desks and one teacher and a student would stand up and say the answer of what they got, you know, I got letter B for this right or violation, and they would either get a yes and then everyone would clap or a no and they would be shamed and they would sit down. Um, and I highlight that because I think it's, it's ironic in a way, but it just kind of highlights the way that this gets approached in the classroom where you have this kind of idea of the importance of discussing rights and uh, group buy-in in those rights and youth agency in discussing those rights and owning them. And then a much more top-down process that relies on kind of traditional notions of respect for elders and youth at the bottom of the totem pole in the way it actually gets enacted. So I hope that answers the question. I'll toss a little bit onto that question. And I don't know, Devorah, if this is relevant to your question or not, but the the other term besides rights that I think needs to be questioned and thought about is the, is the term freedom. And I think that freedoms came to be interpreted, um, you know, the rights and freedoms were all, were the, were the discourse and the dialogue of the resistance movement. But there is some, um, there's some evidence now that freedom is being interpreted as financial freedom or if, you know, without, and I think some of the quotes that I shared with you show that a little bit, that we're not free because we didn't gain our economic economic rights, essentially. Um, and so that kind of fits into the, I think that fits into the same conversation. Um, I want to change the subject too much, but I did, Melissa asked a question about programs similar to the JEP for today's youth. And yeah, this is really interesting, Melissa, that um, there are lots of programs and they, a lot of them have deep roots in the joint enrichment project. So they staff are, the former staff are everywhere in terms of their influence and the program design. But one of the things that's, um, that the former staff are very unhappy about is the sort of fragmentation of the youth sector and kind of farming it out. There's a lot of contracting, a lot of, um, a lot of what's called tender, tenders, right? You put it out for tenders. And so anybody basically can get a contract to do youth development. So the whole concept of integrated youth development or holistic in, uh, youth development has been very diffused and watered down. And that's definitely, um, definitely one, of the, one of the problems. But when you look closely at some of the more promising models that are happening, there's, I'm thinking of Youth Build South Africa, which is an outgrowth of Youth Build um, International. Um, there's a huge model called the Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator that's that's thousands and thousands of young people are part of. And then there's the, the community work program. All of those have very tight ties to the joint enrichment project, either through staff or through the program model. Um, and but and this ties to Tom's question also about the line between particip participants and I think that was yours, was that? 
Oh, yes, because I think it, the Tom's question was about could there be um, a model where, where participants become interns and that gets structured into the program, right? That can be. The trouble with that is that those internship positions, there's a limited number of them. And we're talking about the vast majority of people come in as participants and they don't all want to be youth developers, right, as practitioners. So, but what we are seeing happening, and again, to come ties into Melissa's question, is that some of the efforts in youth development that look like they're the most promising are actually working not just on youth anymore. So moving away from the idea of develop youth, right? But to actually connect youth with opportunities and with employment. Um, I think in the model that I was talking about, it was mostly a give people access to something and something will happen, right? And I don't know if you know, um, the, the Haas Institute for Othering and Belonging at, at UC Berkeley, uh, John Powell down there has done really interesting work on the idea of access alone is, is simply not enough, that people need belonging, they need dignity, and they need connections. And I think that the youth programs that, that seem like they're the most promising at this point are actually working in the interstices, in the intersection of of, of young people and employers, young people and, and, and mentors, right? And not just saying, okay, let's build you up, develop you, and then send you out there because without the social capital and the connections, it doesn't happen. So Tom, yeah, there were at the Joint Enrichment Project in the cohort of folks that I was working with, there were three people, young people who were interns who, went, who were actually a kind of in the, middle, in the middle ground. They did go on to do pretty well for themselves, but they are struggling more than the staff are financially right now, right? They're doing better than the participants. So that it, it plays out exactly as you would expect, like that prism um, of, of reproducing where, where people come in with, the social capital that they come in with. So I think programs that actually deliberately focus on building social capital, making those connections um, are the ones that are the ones that are going to be the most successful. I'll go ahead and jump in and answer Anna's um, question, which is a great one, asking about whether there are parallels to this kind of nostalgia being harnessed elsewhere. Um, and absolutely, you know, I, I when I started writing, doing this project and writing this book, I didn't expect to um, or really want to be quite this timely. Um, but there is certainly a way that nostalgia is harnessed in politics um, all over, right? So the notion of kind of hearkening back to a different type of of America, or, you know, we see this in lots of other campaigns, right, around the world, this idea that we can kind of infuse a sense of nostalgia as a rejection of the present, and particularly a rejection of a certain type of liberalism is something that we see elsewhere. Um, so no, I don't think they're hyperlocal. Certainly the exact ways that they look in this setting are hyperlocal and the ideas about culture. Um, but but there is something global here. So when I started talking about nostalgia, you know, long before the book was finished, but I was doing conference presentations, you know, what would happen all the time was people in the audience saying, you know, I've seen this in the Ukraine, I've seen this in this place. Um, and, you know, I, I was starting to realize there's a larger kind of conversation here about the role of um, recently transitioned nations, particularly to more democratic forms of government um, and this conversation about nostalgia. So there's a really rich literature of nostalgia and post-Soviet nations. Um, it's, I'm happy to give references if people are interested in that, um, talking about kind of how people are nostalgic for the perceived securities of Soviet regimes compared to the feelings of uncertainty that quote unquote freedom has, has brought in, in the sense of democracy. And there's also this tie to neoliberal capitalism and inequality there as well. Um, Michael asked about Stockholm syndrome. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not sure how well I can answer this, but I, I, I will push back a little bit against kind of, or encourage you to not assume it is a kind of Stockholm syndrome, just because I think it's really easy from an outside perspective to assume that that kind of practice is abusive, right? And, and this is certainly not me condoning corporal punishment, right? Um, but at the same time, I think, um, it's easy to chalk up those kinds of attitudes that are positive uh, associations to corporal punishment as there's something, there must be something wrong or there must be some kind of psychological manipulation at play rather than kind of just a very different outlook on the world and a very different outlook on what is um, the correct form of childcare, right? So people really equate 
this type of punishment with correct practices for child rearing. And again, this is not my way of condoning or trying to support corporal punishment myself, but just a way of trying to understand where these sentiments come from and why people are so resistant. Um, young people talk about the idea that, um, you know, in the book, I have a quote, for all of the people you see in parliament to get there, they had to have been beaten as a child, right? And this is really thought of as a positive thing that, you know, this is how you raise proper and good children or raise citizens that know know how to comport themselves. I'll carry on and answer Michael a little bit more since you're on Michael's question. Thanks for identifying the Ford, Michael. Um, I want to talk about that really important question that you asked about the experience of being accepted as a white woman. I'm not sure that I can fully and completely answer that right now, but I do want to say for a long time, um, once I got to South Africa and when I was in the townships, I did not identify myself as anything other than a foreign woman. And I think that made it much easier for me to be accepted because, or at least in my mind, right, I was, it was easier for me to be present because I wasn't a South African person, a white South African. But that only worked for so long. Um, and there was a, there was a breaking point for me, which was 2002, when um, my friends in Soweto actually had they held a wedding party, a celebration for me and Brian. And it brought together families. So it wasn't just me anymore. It brought together our families. And my mother came and my 80, then 82 year old aunt who had never set foot in the township came and we had a big tent and a big celebration. And there was something about that that was, um, that pushed my relationship with or my relationship. It wasn't just me anymore. It was connecting more broadly with my roots and other people's roots. So that was a, that was a step, but certainly your question made me realize that there was something easier about being a foreign woman than being a white uh, South African woman would have been absolutely for sure. And there was it was a long and gradual process moving from, wow, a white woman in Soweto, it's Mandela's miracle, it's come true, which a lot of older people had that, that reaction in the beginning, to having people, being with people as a friend, playing Scrabble with them, you know, learning Zulu from them, um, really being curious about their lives and their, them about my lives and about being, about being people. And so that shift in relationship took took time, um, and I'm sure Amber's had a similar, you know, a similar experience. There's a sociologist, Miranda Fricker, I think is her name, who writes about this idea of epistemic injustice and the, the caution that we have to take as researchers when we go into contexts that are so different from ours, especially if we're writing about them, that we don't represent other people's realities in ways that they wouldn't recognize. And for me, this was as big a challenge as anything else and continues to be as big a challenge as anything else, that the fear that I'm going to represent somebody's worldview in a way that doesn't accurately reflect their worldview. And I think this is what Amber's talking about, too, in her response about the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, so the idea of being a, a charitable listener, of really being really being cautious, I think that that has that has that has helped me a lot. I remember sitting in 1998, sitting in a, um, a meeting of an NGO summit of youth for youth developers and the person who was the director of the Joint Enrichment Project at the time stood up, and I was there, probably one of a few white people, stood up and said, you know, the problem with the youth development sector is that we don't write. Black people don't write. White people write. The university writes, and they denigrate our work. And I was just, I was, I went home in tears. I was stunned. I thought, I can't do this. I can't possibly perpetuate what could potentially be this huge epistemic injustice. I didn't have that frame then, but... Um, and I think this, I think this actually, you know, just having, keeping that idea in, it's a, it's a troubling reality. You can't think it away. You can't write it away. I just need to sit with it. And I need to acknowledge it to the people that I'm working with and the people that I'm talking to. And I guess it also helps not to think of me, not to think of oneself as observing people. I know that was the wording in your question, but, and I know what you mean, but um, that amount, that kind of immersion and that sort of level of being with people rather than observing people, I think it's a really important thing to be super conscious of. I don't, I, that's the best I can do to answer that question. Yeah, Margaret, I can, I can certainly relate to that. I had an experience um, at one point, uh, it was actually I'm trying to remember exactly where I was because it wasn't actually in the rural Eastern Cape. Um, it was in Pretoria, but I was taken by a friend to meet some friends of his um, in what is a, a uh, it's called a hostel. This is kind of unnecessary detail, um, but 
but the, it's a, a kind of a place where migrant workers are. And he was showing me around and introducing me to other workers there in this space. And um, and I overheard, I don't think he realized I had some language competence. And I, I overheard a snippet of what he said to somebody, which was basically, you know, she's not South African, um, she's American. So she's one of the good ones. And it was really jarring. And, you know, I had some sense that that might be underneath things, but I hadn't heard it explicitly. Um, and it was really this moment of exactly what Margaret said of, wow, if I were a white South African, this would be a, I either wouldn't be able to do it at all, or it just would be a very different kind of project because, um, you know, obviously being a white woman is part of my positionality there, but, but so is being American very much. And that's a label that I wear that people are very much conscious of and thinking about when they interact with me. Amber, I don't know if you had this experience because you were living in a very different um, environment in the rural environment, but um, when I would, I mean, I obviously had white friends in the, in the suburbs as well, and it was those people mostly who would say, what are you doing? You're crazy. It's dangerous. You know, those, those sorts of attitudes were so still prevalent, and I did feel like one of the things that I was doing, you know, as much of a mess maybe as I was making in terms of my committing epistemic injustice, that maybe <laughs> one of the things that I was doing was also kind of pushing people's thinking a little bit and making them realize that it wasn't quite maybe the way they saw things and that my outside perspective was valuable was valuable that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of those experiences, definitely. And um, telling people that, you know, you tell people the exact location of where you're doing research in, you know, the white community and they're kind of horrified and they don't think it's possible. And they think, you know, how are you still alive when in fact the rates of crime are, um, not nearly as bad as in certain urban areas um, that are much wealthier. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to kind of sugarcoat my ability to change things, but I certainly have had formative experiences where I feel like um, people have had a chance to kind of have conversations with me that they wouldn't have had otherwise and, and vice versa. And I've learned from them and, um, and it's, yeah, it's been really meaningful and life-changing, if not, you know, certainly at times uncomfortable, but in a necessary kind of way. I'm really happy to see a question from my brother, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, nowadays, I mean, the question about do South African students and families learn about democracy mm -hmm. and contemporary racism, like yeah, in places great like the US, it's a great question. And what do they learn, right? Like, what are they exposed mm -hmm. to? I don't know about your what's up, but I get all kinds of things from people lately when people have been seeing what's happening in the US with shock and uh, sometimes with like, how could that possibly be happening, right? Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. So, you know, my, my immediate reaction when I saw Jonathan's question was, man, that'd be fascinating to study right now after the George Floyd protests because, um, and obviously this depends on who you're talking to and how much experience they have and connection outside and, you know, what kind of education level they have because when people go to college or leave rural areas, they get exposed to other things. Um, but, you know, I don't see in short a lot of exposure to the awareness of racism elsewhere. Um, so I frequently have the experience of young people in this rural area um, telling me that they assume or, you know, demonstrating that they assume that Black people in the U.S. are wealthier, more beautiful, more fashionable, and that's because they see uh, shows from the U.S. with Black people and they think that that is Black people in the U.S. I mean, they think that about white people on TV from the U.S. as well, um, but they also believe a lot of the narratives that TV espouses about, you know, some post-racial panacea that doesn't exist. So yeah, there's, there's definitely shock sometimes when I tell people in these rural areas that, um, that actually, you know, we have a quite racist society, that we have poverty, that we have inequality. There's a lot of surprise. So I'd be fascinated to see how the recent protests may or may not have changed that. I think Devorah might have some ideas right there. Mm. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities, absolutely. I'd be curious, Margaret, to hear if you see nostalgia among your participants for that moment of hope, you know, that because that's something I've read in other accounts of yeah. nostalgia, this idea of nostalgia, not for a different past, but for the past that had hope in a different way. Well, they certainly talk about it still, and they there's a nostalgia for that. But, you know, the nostalgia, in a way, I almost hesitate, I was going to say this, but I, I guess I can say it because it might not be true, but I get the sense sometimes that the moment that they had in the Joint Enrichment Project for those folks was, looking back, was a much more powerful and meaningful moment than 1994 was for them, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Time, they wouldn't have said that, but, the, but now this is just, it's so powerful when they look back at it as this kind of emotional touchstone of who I am, 
came out of that time and who I thought I was going to be in 1994 didn't happen. And there's, like I said, there's a huge amount of disillusionment with the government, even anger, right? With the amount of corruption and the, the people feeling kind of cheated out of what they thought was their, their right going forward. And um, so, yes, I mean, I think I do see that. I do see that it's not, I didn't, I did not see, and I don't hear a nostalgia for going back to apartheid days in the population of people that I know so well, but um, yeah. yeah, and I think, again, that kind of highlights the differences in terms of rural versus urban experiences of apartheid, where if you were in urban township, you were um, coming face to face with those kinds of injustices on, probably on a daily basis. Whereas in a rural area, you know, I've talked to people who said, I didn't even realize I lived in an oppressed, as part of an oppressed group until I was an adult or until I left the homeland, um, because they didn't get to see that anyone else was living any other way. And there was no, um, there was no television in South Africa until 1976. And uh, when it did come out, it was for white people and in English. So they weren't getting information, right? Information was tightly controlled by a, by an authoritarian state. And I, I can actually tie Sophia's question into this as well, because some of the nostalgia um, brings, uh, brings up music and cultural traditions that are somehow being lost. You know, the young people, I mean, in some ways, this is a kind of universal discourse, right? Young people today don't like, you know, our traditional music. They don't do our traditional dances. They don't, um, close to people have a rich culture and history of beadwork, of really intricate hand, hand on beadwork. And there's a discussion of, you know, young people don't want to learn that and that's going to be lost. So that is part of it. It's interestingly, the, the Joint Enrichment Project, when it was first started in the 1980s, when it was, it was actually started as kind of a harbor for resistance era leaders, kind of a place of hiding where people could hide in a sanctuary for young people who had been, who were being chased by police and had no place to go or who'd been hurt or who were from other parts of the country and needed a sanctuary. But the second thing that they did was they started music programs and cultural programs with the idea that young people needed to embrace these, you know, embrace the, the, these parts of themselves. Um, and connect with their connect with their culture, and so th they did that as a, as an organization. And then eventually they moved into the schools and they did music education and cultural cultural education days in in schools. So that was kind of the initial trajectory of that organization. Of course, uh, music has a huge had played a huge role in the anti-apartheid struggle and the exiled musicians who went throughout the world and spread news and you know shared what was happening and became um, cultural leaders and returned eventually many of them um, as as um, you know, celebrated heroes. I think that's really important as well. But that's a piece. That's a piece of it. There's. I don't know that. Unfortunately, I don't know that much about the contemporary music scene in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, I know a little bit, not enough to do justice to that. But there's some other great questions here. I love Jillian's question about introducing this to high school classrooms. I am. Um, I don't have an immediate text that comes to mind, but I'm happy to answer emails about this and continue the discussion. Um, and then I'll let it, Margaret answer because I know it was to you. But um, but I used to teach high school students in an after school program, and this is you know something that I think about and I'm interested in. Likewise, and I'm actually in the process of kind of compiling a list of sort of literature that might be good for young adults so th that would because I think Jillian, the, one of the ways in is is through is through literature and stories, right? And so that's one of the best ways rather than hitting people over the head with, you know. Um, historical and sociological information. I think it's. I think that literature can be a really good way in. So I'd be happy to talk about that if that's something you're thinking about doing in your class. So we are coming up on an hour and a half together, um, which is a very long time for Zoom in general. But I, I think if we just want to end with just a kind of a final statement, I see a couple of questions on here about where do we go from here or mm -hmm. what are the next steps? So maybe we can end your talk with each of you kind of sharing what those next steps might be. I'm happy to go ahead and, and talk uh, about, you know, part of the question or one of these questions talked about NGOs and I can briefly mention that the book talks uh, about an NGO that I've done work with called the Sanke Gender Justice Network. Um, and, and I don't wanna suggest that this is necessarily the answer. There isn't a the answer, but there are a lot of amazing organizations out there um, that despite the fact that I have critiques about it in the book are trying to advance um, certain ideas of teaching democracy and talking to people um, and addressing different kind of cultural realities in a more nuanced way and from a more grassroots place. Um, so there are a lot of amazing organizations out there that are trying to do this work. 
I'll just piggyback on that because I agree. And I think that what I think that the in terms of the NGO world, I think that the shift needs to be I mean, there have been advocates of this for, for years, but I think the shift needs to be away now from the idea of development, even though youth development is in the title of my book, I feel like it's a problematic concept because it does suggest that there's something that needs to be developed from maybe from outside or above and the idea of youth engagement is maybe a more um, a more viable a more viable one. And I'm excited by these programs that seem to be working in the intersection, not just on young people, but in the intersection and relationships between, uh, between employees and employers, young people and mentors, that sort of thing. So that's what I'm most excited about. And I hope that some of the influences of my folks and the Joint Enrichment Project can, can come to bear on that. I love that. I think that's a perfect way to kind of wrap up such an insightful conversation. And Thank you to everybody who attended tonight and asked questions and participated in this session. Um, Margaret and Amber, just again, thank you so much for just a really insightful and powerful conversation. This webinar is recorded. And so that recording will be sent out to everybody um, probably in a couple of weeks once we get subtitles and everything going. So I appreciate your patience with that. Um, but you will be receiving an email likely tomorrow with a post survey in it, as well as direct contact links for both Margaret and Amber. So if your question was not answered or if you just wanna read their books or get connected with them, you will have that information in your email. Um, I do wanna highlight just one real quick, our next event or our event that we're gonna have in March is going to be with Betty LaDuke and it is titled Art, Community and Social Justice, Reflecting on the Challenges of 2020. So I do hope you'll join us back here on Zoom again for that event and just, uh, come prepared with more questions and a great time here on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Friends webinar.